Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started here. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, it's a little bit warmer this week than it was last week, but I appreciate you making the trip out here, uh, particularly on short notice. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Elizabeth Eastman in just a, a moment, but before I do that, I want to uh, introduce myself and welcome you to some Benson Center events and tell you about upcoming lectures. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hale. I'm the interim director of the Benson Center for this year. I'm a professor in the uh, uh, philosophy uh, department and the environmental studies program. I, uh, I have been in this position since the beginning of the year. It's been pretty exciting. We've done a ton of things already. Um, I'm not going to list those. If you want to see some of our previous uh, lectures, you're more than welcome to go to our website and see. We have all of the lectures from earlier this semester and even previous semesters up online archived. So if you feel like you want to spend an hour or two uh, watching those, you can, you can do that there. Um, just to give you a sense of what's coming up, uh, however, we have uh, next week, uh, we will have, um, on November 11th, uh, we'll have John Eastman uh, visiting us, uh, giving a talk. Related by marriage. Related by marriage. Uh, so this is an unusual sort of duo uh, situation here. Um, but John Eastman is coming out uh, next week. He'll be giving a talk in Ramali uh, N1B23. Uh, his, the title of his talk is Born in the USA, Revisiting the 14th Amendment Citizenship Clause. Um, following that, we'll have, uh, on November 14th, Larry Temkin and Jason Brennan discussing capitalism, the good, the bad, and the ugly. On December 1st at Boulder Public Li Library, we'll have our VSCTP scholar Colleen Shahan here uh, giving a talk on Jane Austen's Emma film screening. Um, that will be at the Boulder Public Library, as I mentioned. And then later in the semester on December 1st, we'll have Robert Zimmer, the president of the University of Chicago, uh, talking in the Humanities Building in room 250. Um, Go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, you can, we have many more talks, of course, next semester as well, and you can go check out our calendar there. That calendar is rapidly, you know, being filled in. Uh, so keep, uh, pay close attention to what's happening. Um, and also, uh, if you're at all curious about what we're doing and you can't make it out here, you can check out our Twitter feed, uh, which is located up there. I don't actually know how to use Twitter myself, so uh, uh, <laughs> I'll off. leave that up to you. <laughs> yeah, I find it, I find it. Uh, yeah, uh, confusing. Anyway, so uh, without saying any more about the Benson Center, let me just introduce you to Elizabeth Eastman, our guest here. Uh, she has a political a PhD in political science from Claremont Graduate School and an MA in liberal education from St. John's College and a BA in French literature and civilization from Scripps College. Uh, she is taught in the political science and history departments at Chapman University and at Azusa Pacific University in California and in the liberal arts programs at Roosevelt University in Chicago and at California State University at Fullerton. She currently lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, she has a dog. Uh, <laughs> 17. 17 year old dog, I learned earlier this afternoon, um, and is now writing a book on citizen and community. I think we're going to be hearing a little bit about that book tonight. The title of her talk is Antigone and Socrates Model Citizens or Rebels. So join me in welcoming Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I want to tell you, first of all, that um, uh, somebody mentioned today that I'm old school. Uh, I come from a tradition where a lecture is prepared in advance and it is read. So I will be reading a lecture for about 50 to 55 minutes. And then be, I will welcome your questions afterwards. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizer of this evening's event, as well as the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization. I come from a liberal arts background, both as a student and as a teacher. I read, study, and teach those books that form the liberal tradition. In other words, writings that aim to free the mind. I begin with Homer and the Greek tragedians, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and continue through the centuries to understand their teachings and to seek and discern their relevance to our current conversations. My remarks this evening are about community generally, and specifically citizens. We form communities for many reasons. The natural progression described from Aristotle, by Aristotle in the politics, begins with a family that joins others to form a village, and those villages grow larger to form a city, the polis in Greek. Within the city or community, the citizens are further united or divided by politics, tradition, family, race, or religion. A successful community depends largely upon a citizenry that is engaged in a variety of pursuits to meet their private responsibilities and public obligations. They accomplish this by nurturing their families and by forming associations and governing bodies that foster engagement to meet immediate and long-term needs. Citizens who share a common understanding of the foundation of their community and work to preserve it 
must develop the means to, to meet current and future challenges. Harmony and respect are desirable when building a community and perpetuating its institutions, but conflict and strife can imperil the success of these pursuits. Two well-known characters, Antigone and Socrates, initiate a discussion of citizens from different perspectives. The action in Sophocles' Antigone and Plato's Apology of Socrates and, and the Crito thrusts the reader into the main character's confrontations with the political order. The dilemma of following the law or challenging those in power prompts questions about the nature of citizens and their obligations to their family, fellow citizens, and community. Both were charged with crimes and suffered punishments. Overshadowing the obvious question of innocence versus guilt is the more pressing question of whether their actions harmed the community or improved it. These topics invite more general questions about present day citizens and their responsibilities and struggles. I would like to share one more preliminary remark before returning to Antigone and Socrates. Civic discourse in America is increasingly divisive and hostile. This contributes to the failure to achieve consensus in building and preserving communities, in governance, and in defining the goals of civic institutions. A means to overcome the rupture in America's discourse, ironically, may be found in readings that are far removed from present-day America. I aim to do just that with works by Sophocles and Plato. I begin with brief summaries of the play and dialogues and, introduce, uh, and introductions to Antigone and Socrates, then continue with the comparison of the two figures and the relevance of their works to the larger discussion of citizens in the community. Sophocles' Antigone. Antigone is among the more famous figures in the annals of tragedy. Sophocles' play, named for the young woman, is set in the city of Thebes, a monarchy previously ruled by her father Oedipus, and in the play by Creon, her uncle. Antigone is at odds with Creon when she performs an act that honors her family. He deems her action a direct challenge to his rule and the political regime when she violates a proclamation that he has issued. Creon's justification for calling her a criminal and her defense highlight the moral dilemma of acting on behalf of her family and community in contravention to the law. Antigone's story is a familiar one, but a description of the turmoil explains how she is at the forefront of a discussion of whether she is abiding by or in conflict with the law, and whether she harms or benefits the community. A proclamation handed down by Creon in the aftermath of a civil war initiates the immediate ev events of the tragedy Antigone. The chorus recounts what leads to the proclamation. Quote, at seven gates stood seven captains, ranged equals against equals, and there left their brazen suits of armor to Zeus, the god of trophies. Only those two wretches, born of one father and mother, set their spears to win a victory on both sides. They worked out their share in a common death." Close quote. The two wretches are Antigone's brothers, Eteocles and Polynices. The father and mother are her parents, Oedipus and Jocasta. These names are familiar to those who have read another of Sophocles' plays, Oedipus the King. For the present, we need only be reminded that Oedipus unknowingly murdered his father, Laius, and married his mother, Jocasta. Creon, brother of Jocasta and uncle to the four children that issued from that marriage, is the new king of Thebes. He issues a proclamation that Eteocles, who defended the city in the Civil War, is to receive a full burial, whereas his brother, Polynices, who attacked the city, is not to be buried, mourned or honored, but left exposed for the birds and dogs. The punishment for anyone violating the proclamation is death by public stoning. We first meet Antigone outside the palace gates as she relates the details of the proclamation to Ismene, her sister and closest living relative. She asks, to share, she asks her to share in the work of bearing their brother Polynices. Ismene recoils at her sister's plan, but Antigone is not deterred and alone performs the burial rites. When caught, she readily admits to Creon that she performed the deed, replying, quote, it was not Zeus that made the proclamation, nor did justice, which lives with those below, enact such laws as that for mankind, close quote. Antigone's act is an expression of piety, and her resolve to bury her brother is informed by family ties and a higher law. Creon responds by remarking on her insolence at breaking the established law and boasting of it. Creon sentences her to death in spite of appeals by Ismene and his son Haman, who is betrothed to Antigone. Creon remains firm in his decision until the blind prophet Tiresias warns him that it is wrong not to bury Polynices and to condemn Antigone to death. Quote, for you have thrust one that belongs above, below the earth, 
and bitterly dishonored a living soul by lodging her in the grave. While the one that belonged indeed to the underworld gods you have kept on the earth without due share of rites of burial, of due funeral offerings, a corpse unhallowed." Close quote. Crean eventually reverses his decision, but not before suffering the loss of those family members closest to him. Now I turn to Plato's apology of Socrates and Crito. Socrates is known to readers through the dialogues of Plato and Xenophon. The term dialogue is aptly chosen because it is the conversations that Socrates had with <coughs> others in Athens that make him such a well-known figure. It is also these conversations that brings a 70-year-old Socrates to an Athenian court to defend himself against charges brought by others in Athens. His defense speech offers an explanation of his life, including his devotion to persuading his fellow citizens to care for virtue, which he argues is beneficial, but that others see as a threat to themselves and to the political regime. The Platonic dialogues of the Apology of Socrates and Crito recount the trial and the subsequent events after the delivery of the verdict and the sentencing. His speeches to the jury and explanation of the reasons for his actions to his friend Crito provide insight into Socrates as a citizen in the community and whether he harms or benefits it. The apology begins with Socrates addressing the jury, who had just heard from his three accusers. Quote, How you men of Athens have been affected by my accusers, I do not know. For my part, even I nearly forgot myself because of them so persuasively did they speak. And yet they have said, so to speak, nothing true. Close quote. The accusers have charged Socrates with doing injustice in two ways. Quote, by corrupting the young, by not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other daimonia that are novel. Close quote. Socrates defends himself against these charges and the slanders against him. The origin of the slander, Socrates exclaims, explains, comes from when his friend Chirophon asked the oracle at Delphi if anyone was wiser than Socrates. Quote, the Pythia replied that no one was wiser. Close quote. Socrates did not believe that he was wise and so looked to investigate the pronouncement by examining those who were reputed to be wise. He began with the politicians, and after conversing, Socrates thought that he was a little wiser and imparts to the jurors the following, quote, I am wiser than this human being, for probably neither of us knows anything noble and good, but he supposes he knows something when he does not know, while I, just as I do not know, do not even suppose that I do. I am likely to be a little bit wiser than he in this very thing, that whatever I do not know, I do not even suppose I know." Close quote. Socrates continued in his quest to understand the meaning of the oracle and questioned poets and manual artisans, but he only incurred the hatred of many. With the explanation of the origin of the slanders complete, Socrates responds to the charges that have brought him to court and defends his lifelong pursuit, that of persuading his fellow citizens to care for virtue and the city. Quote, are you not ashamed that you care for having as much money as possible and reputation and honor, but that you neither care for nor give thought to prudence and truth and how your soul will be the best possible? I will not immediately let him go, nor will I go away, but I will speak to him and examine and test him. And if he does not seem to me to possess virtue, but one says he does, I will reproach him and saying that he regards the things worth the most as the least important and the paltrier things as more important." Close quote. Socrates rejects begging the jurors to acquit him, but chooses instead to teach and persuade in speech as he has done throughout his life. The jury finds him guilty, and his accusers call for the death penalty. Socrates' counterproposal rejects exile and foregoing speaking publicly, and instead offers to pay a fine and proposes free meals in the Prytaneum, similar to what those who have brought honor to Athens or performed great deeds receive. The jury condemns him to death. The ensuing dialogue between Socrates and Crito takes place in the jail cell, where Socrates awaits his punishment. Crito comes to Socrates to persuade him to flee and gives him several reasons to do so. Socrates replies to all of them and in turn questions Crito. When he can no longer respond, Socrates asks his friends asked his friend, what if the laws in the community of the city should come and stand before us who are about to run away or whatever name we should give it? From here and ask, quote, tell me, Socrates, what do you have in mind to do? By this deed that you are attempting, what do you think you're doing if not destroying us laws and the whole city as far as it lies in you? Or does it seem possible to you for a city to continue to exist and not to be overturned, in which the judgments that are reached have no strength but are rendered ineffective and are corrupted by private men? 
close quote. An exchange ensues that expands the scope <clears throat> from that of a solar actor, Socrates, to one whose actions affect the city as a whole. Whereas the apology presents Socrates as the philosopher in the city, the Crito presents him as a member of the community and a private man. An unjust verdict raises the choice of ignoring the judgment and fleeing, or abiding by it and accepting the punishment. The former contributes to the destruction of the city, the latter supports it. The laws in the community of the city present their defense of the city by examining Socrates' relation to it. Socrates chooses not to flee, and he remains in prison, awaiting his death sentence. The comparison of Antigone and Socrates. Two more seemingly different characters could not be chosen to initiate a discussion of the citizen. Their differences reflect their particular circumstances and experiences that led them to a public judgment. But their similarities come to the forefront when their actions as citizens and their effect and impact on their communities and others are examined. The youth of Antigone is a striking contrast to the 70-year-old Socrates. The young woman, betrothed to Haman, laments that she will not have a family of her own, whereas Socrates refuses to bring his children to beg for acquittal before the jurors. Their varying reactions to their death sentences also reflect their age and experience. As Antigone marches to her death, she exclaims, quote, I am the last of them, and I go down in the worst death of all, for I have not lived the due term of my life, close quote. But she takes consolation in that she will lie at the side of her brother. Socrates' reaction differs as he speaks to the jurors. Quote, for to fear deathbed is in fact nothing other than to seem to be wise, but not be so. For it is to seem to know what one does not know. No one knows whether death does not even happen, even happen to be the greatest of all goods for the human being. But people fear it as though they knew well that it is the greatest of evils, close quote. He also muses over the possibility of engaging great figures in dialogue in the afterlife. Socrates is not fearful to look forward, but Antigone laments the future that she will not have. They also evoke strong reactions that differ in kind. In love with the impossible and having the savage spirit of a savage father are the words of her sister Ismene in the chorus to describe Antigone. Socrates is called by his accusers someone most disgusting and that he corrupts the young. They elicit a different kind of sympathy as well. Ismene tells her sister, quote, though you are wrong to go bury our brother, your friends are right to love you, close quote. And Haman tells Creon that the city mourns for her. Socrates acknowledges the fathers of those youth who listen to him question others and have come to the trial to support him and to assist him in paying a fine. These differences again reflect their, di their distinct situations, but there is a similarity in the members of the community who support them. Though Antigone and Socrates are solitary figures carrying out particular acts, the communities recognize that the results of their actions benefit the whole community, in part because of their reverence and devotion to good. Neither acts for personal gain. Socrates admits to being careless of his own things and those of his family, quote, not caring for things that the many do, money-making and household management, generalships, and popular oratory, close quote and that his impoverished family is the result of the life that he has led. Antigone starkly decries the result of her action. Quote, no tears for me, no friends, no marriage, close quote. Neither acts for political gain nor expresses political ambition as evidenced by their private conduct. Antigone speaks to Ismene privately outside of the palace gates when she proposes that they defy the proclamation and goes outside of the city where Polynices lay to perform the, their rites. Socrates reminds the jurors that he went to each of them privately to persuade them, quote, not to care for any of his own things until he cares for himself, how he will be the best possible and most prudent possible, not to care for the things of the city until he cares for the city itself, and so to care for other things in the same way. Close quote. He likens himself as a father or a brother to persuade them to care for virtue. Yet in spite of their disregard for personal or political gain, both are perceived as threats to those in power. The chorus acknowledges a certain reverence for the piety that Antigone exhibits, but they also admit that Creon cannot see his authority defied. Creon calls Antigone as many, quote, two rebels against my throne, close quote. Socrates knew that to fight for the just, he must lead a private life. But in spite of this, he is charged and must come to court to respond to his accuser's attacks and to the slander and envy of the many that he predicts will convict him. Both are forthright in their explanations of their behavior and choices and express a shared devotion to piety. 
For Antigone, honoring her brother with burial is one episode in her short life, but she argues that she must perform this pious act because her mother and father are not alive to bury their son. Though young in years, she willingly embraces an obligation that only she can execute as her sister refuses to join her. Socrates devotes his life to encouraging wisdom and virtue among his fellow citizens and repeatedly mentions that he is following the god. Antigone acts knowing fully that burying her brother may be her last deed, as does Socrates, whose public examination of known figures brings much attention to him. Yet neither are deterred. They are steadfast in what must be done. Socrates explains to the juror, quote, wherever someone stations himself, holding that it is best, or wherever he is stationed by a ruler, there he must stay and run the risk, as it seems to me, and not take into account death or anything else compared to what is shameful, close quote. He draws an analogy between a ruler stationing him in battle and God stationing him, quote, to live philosophizing and examining myself and others, close quote. While different actions are required at the posts that Socrates and Antigone assume, their efforts re in result in what can be understood as a defense of the city. The defense is initially rooted in what brings Antigone and Socrates to the forefront. In the case of Antigone, it is honoring the dead, regardless of the actions of that person while alive. She does not distinguish between her brothers as Creon has, and argues that they both deserve burial according to the god of death. She also speaks of a law that requires her to assume this responsibility and asks, what law of God has she broken that brings her the punishment of death? In the case of Socrates, it is speaking openly about wisdom and virtue to the citizenry, which includes the youth of the citizen, excuse me, the youth of the city, future citizens, hearing him. He implores all to lead a virtuous life and be open to wisdom by not deceiving themselves about having knowledge that they do not have in this city of Athens known as, quote, the greatest and best reputed for wisdom and strength, close quote. Superior to money, reputation, and honor are prudence, truth, and their souls being the best possible. He asks if they are not ashamed that, they're ca that they care more for the former than the latter. Socrates and Antigone, as different as they appear to be, are unified in their actions as citizens on, and on behalf of the good of the community. Those in Athens who come to Socrates' trial to support their friend, and those in Thebes who believe the young girl is wrongly and undeservedly dying, recognize that the actions of these two citizens are on behalf of something far greater than discourse in a public square or a mere observation of a burial rite. The support and sympathy that their respective communities offer is sincere and defies those in power. Similar to the actions of Socrates and Antigone, the communities are not supporting them out of self-interest, but because a greater good is apparent. Both characters defend and support the good and the perpetuation of the community by standing firm in their present circumstance, knowing that had Polynices remained unburied and Socrates stayed silent, both communities would have been the worse for it. The family traditions that Antigone upholds are the foundation of the city. She cries, quote, my city, rich citizens of my city, close quote, and, is, and asks for pity as she walks to death, quote, unbedded, without bridal, without share in marriage, and in nurturing of children, close quote. She fulfills the most private obli of obligations to her family and the most public of burial rites for all. The city benefits from the observance of both. She also had the courage to act in spite of Creon, a solitary ruler wielding the power of life and death over his citizens. Creon's reputation as a good monarch veers toward tyranny as he refuses to reconsider his proclamation or accept counsel. The chorus, came, the chorus claims that Antigone went against the high throne of justice, but the question must be asked whether Creon's actions destroyed any semblance of justice. Socrates' call to be virtuous is key to forming the character of citizens and is a necessary foundation for a strong community and a good government. He invokes family, not in the manner of regret that Antigone, who will not raise a family in the city, expresses, but by his concern that they become good citizens. He calls upon others to ensure that this happens after pronouncement of his sentence, asking his fellow Athenian citizens to punish and rebuke his children if they do not care for virtue after his death. His devotion to wisdom, virtue, and having the best soul is of great consequence in a democracy where the majority of citizens participate in debate and governance, but the threat of falling prey to mob rule or the corrupt few is always present. Socrates in his trial says of his friends, the fathers of the youths who listen to him speak publicly 
and fellow citizens that, quote, everyone is ready to come to aid me, the corrupter, the one who does evil to their families, as his accusers, Melitus and Anatus, say. So what other reason would they have to come to my aid except the correct and just one, that they are conscious that Melitus speaks falsely while I am being truthful, close quote. Those who willingly aid Socrates recognize that his life devotion is beneficial to them, the city, and its governance. There are two additional characters who appear at the end of the Antigone and the Crito, Tiresias and the personification of the laws and the community of the city, respectively. They expand the sphere from personal or private activity to a more comprehensive scope and explain further the defense of the city from a different vantage point. Tiresias is critical of Creon's acts of violence against Antigone and Polynices. His visit to Creon is prompted by what he calls the city's sickness that is caused by the flesh of Polynices and the sacrificial hearths, and he cautions him of the impending doom, but to no avail. Like Haman, who forewarns his father Creon about imperiling his rule over the city, Tiresias warns him that his family will suffer, and other cities will be angry at him for abiding by his proclamation, which allows for burial rites performed by dogs and wild beasts. In the dialogue between Socrates and Crito about whether he should attempt an escape from prison, the laws in the community of the city make clear the harm that would be inflicted upon his fellow citizens and his city. The reason that they give is that nothing is more important than justice. They remind Socrates that there is agreement among citizens, quote, to abide by whatever judgments the city reaches in trials, close quote. The laws in the community of the city ask him, quote, what charge are you bringing against us in the city that you are attempting to destroy us, close quote. They also ask Socrates if he is not aware that the fatherland is more venerable, more holy, more highly esteemed among gods and among human beings who are intelligent. Socrates risks become a corrupter of law should he flee, whether if he, whereas if he accepts a punishment, he will have been done in injustice by his fellow human beings and not the laws. The arguments of Tiresias and the laws in the community of the city accomplish two things. First, they cast the actions of Antigone and Socrates in a greater purview. And second, they underscore that they both defend the city by upholding the traditions and the justice that serve as the foundation of the city. Traditions serve to form bonds among family members and ties between generations. Just conduct informs the behavior among citizens and between the citizens and the governing bodies. As previously discussed, the questions one, who is on trial, and two, who is being judged, also in arise in light of defending the city. The Antigone and the Apology begin with the main characters explaining their actions to those who will determine whether they live or die, and subsequently in the Acrido, whether Socrates responding to those who urge him to flee. In the course of the defense, it becomes clear that Creon and Socrates' accusers, jurors, and friends who want to assist him to escape are the ones being judged because they are the threats to the communities. Among their transgressions in Antigone are Creon denying the right of burial, ignoring the old laws, and wise advice in acting the tyrant. In the Apology, the transgressions include the accusers trying to silence Socrates, others slandering him and philosophy, jurors being persuaded by the lies and calumnies against Socrates, and his friends urging him to disregard the verdict and flee. Their judges are Tiresias, the citizens, the laws in the community of the city, the gods, Antigone, and Socrates. It is the subsequent conviction and punishment of those wrongly charged that caused the city and the community to suffer. In Athens for killing a wise man and in Thebes for denying burial to one and putting under the earth one who should remain above. While Antigone and Socrates submit to the formal punishment meted out, those whose actions and decisions are also being judged suffer from unjust verdicts and punishments. It is Tiresias' prophecy that moves Creon to act, quote, I must give up what my heart would have me do, but it is ill to fight against what must be, close quote. Creon's recognition is too late because his prior actions have led him, his family, and the community to a path of destruction. Antigone, his wife Eurydice, and son Haman commit suicide. He will have no progeny from the marriages of his children, and he has fallen from his position of ruler in the eyes of the citizens, Tiresias, and the chorus. In the Apology, though Socrates remarks on the closeness of the vote, quote, if only 30 votes had fallen differently, I would have been acquitted, close quote. 
The city of Athens is known for the judgment against and punishment of one calling for wisdom and virtue and his moderating influence over others. Socrates accepts his death sentence and rejects efforts to entice him to escape, reaffirming that an injustice is not to be met with an injustice. Thus far, we have thought of Antigone and Socrates independently and within their specific setting. But Socrates' teaching informs Antigone, informs what Antigone has done on behalf of her family and the city. With respect to virtue, Antigone is the citizen whom Socrates encouraged and dedicated his life to cultivate. She cares for her family, the city, and the gods before she cares for any of her own things and the things of the city. Though she laments the family that she will not have, it is not only a loss for her, but for the city as well, because family is a key feature of the foundation of a community. His teaching also informs the failings of Creon, who believed himself to be wise and not in need of counsel from others. Creon looks for affirmation from the chorus, remarking, quote, you will do my bidding, close quote. He rejects the advice from Haman, asking if men his age should learn, his, learn wisdom from young men, such as his son. He repeatedly accuses Tiresias of greed and seeking profit, though he admits, quote, that never in the past have I turned from your advice, close quote. Creon pays a great price for his self-defection and lack of understanding, as does his family, Antigone, and the city. He agrees with the chorus that he has learned justice too late and with bitterness. The events in the Antigone affirm that wisdom, virtue, and justice, as well as the foundation of family, benefit the community, the citizenry, and government in both the traditional monarchy of Thebes and the more democratic Athens. When they are ignored or rejected, the communities are at risk, are at risk or fail. Socrates' teaching as presented in the Apology is thus affirmed. What lessons can we draw from these works? Both dialogues raise questions about the role of citizen in the community and allow a fuller picture of the citizen as well as the citizen in relation to the family and the community. Does their defiance make for a fuller description of a, the good citizen or do they harm the community? We conclude with a broader discussion of the citizen in the community. Sophocles' Antigone and Plato's Apology of Socrates and Crito could not differ more in their particular circumstances and outward appearances of the two characters as explained above. But the content of these works is complementary in a manner that leads, insights, leads to insights into citizens, communities, and governance. The array of characters in these works represents every facet of the community and draws attention to its interwoven nature. The recurring themes of wisdom, virtue, and justice guide and inform the behavior of the citizenry and well-being of the community. The works also offer clarity on law with respect to governance. Finally, Socrates' concern with living well and its connection to the citizenry and community is made clear. The many and varied characters of the tragedy and dialogues comprehend the whole of the community. They include husband and wife, sons and daughters, current and political future, current and future political leaders, citizens who accuse, judge, and convict a fellow citizen, friends and supporters of the accused who were among the wealthy citizens and fathers of the youth, and future citizens who were purportedly corrupted, and two prophets, a one a blind seer, another who divines prophecies before his death. These individuals also comprise groups within the community. The family is the foundation of the community, the citizens are the body, the political leadership is the governance, and those who prophesy about the present and future draw insights from the divine about the well-being and the direction of the community. Their presence reveals the complex interweaving of a community. Due to these complex relations, the despair that marks the end of these works by Sophocles and Plato have far-reaching consequences. The families of Oedipus and Creon meet with tragic ends, and Socrates is sentenced to death. The wives of Oedipus and Creon take their own lives out of agony, Oedipus' son, sons, Ateocles and Polynices, die in battle. Creon's son dies by his own hand before he can wed Antigone and begin a family. The surviving children of Oedipus, Antigone and Ismene, are divided over honoring and bearing their brother and honoring the sovereign Creon's decree and power. Tiresias the prophet has neither family nor civic ties, but whose devotion to the divine that puts him in a separate realm altogether is disrespected and slandered by Creon after foretelling of the doom that he is causing to fall upon the city. Antigone dies as a youthful maiden. Socrates submits to a verdict and punishment that his friends call shameful. With such a calamitous collapse, what insights can we draw to, that speak to forming good citizens 
and constituting and perpetuating good communities. One response is to be guided by the themes of chance, destiny, and fate, that in the Antigone and intimate and intimate that events are beyond the control of actors. The messenger in the Antigone remarks, there is no condition of man's life that stands secure. Quote, and as and such I would not Praise it or blame, it is chance that sets upright. It is chance that brings down the lucky and unlucky, each in his turn. For men that belong to death, there is no profit of established things." Close quote. The chorus tells Creon, quote, for what is destined to us, men mortal, there is no escape, close quote. To which Creon, who believes that he killed his son and wife, replies that an unwelcome fate has leapt upon him. These sentiments lead in the direction of one's passive presence in the community and external factors at determining events. A more satisfactory response is to take seriously the exhortations to wisdom, virtue, and justice in these writings. The chorus, previous assertions notwithstanding, concludes the Antigone with the pronouncement that, quote, wisdom is far the chief element of happiness, and secondly, no irreverence toward the gods. But great words of haughty men exact in retribution blows as great and in old age teach wisdom." Close quote. Tiresias tells Creon, quote, how much the best of possessions is the ability to listen to wise advice, close quote. But Creon repeatedly rejects advice and wise counsel, and when the consequences of his decisions are apparent, he calls himself a vain, silly man. The theme of wisdom is present in the Apology as Socrates devotes his life to showing others that they are not wise and imparting to them that he differs by understanding that whatever he does not know, he does not even suppose he knows. Socrates' unending pursuit of virtue is one that he practices in his life and encourages in the lives of his children and fellow citizens. He also comes to court to give a defense speech because, quote, the law must be obeyed, close quote, and chooses to submit to his punishment, thus avoiding weakening the just of justice, the weakening of justice and the laws of the community. These exhortations to wisdom, virtue, and justice inform private conduct in the household, public conduct as a citizen, and the formation of a just community. They are also a direct challenge to a passive approach that defaults chance, that defaults to chance, destiny, and fate, and instead, lead to active engagement in the public and private realms. Active participation takes many forms, but begins with the reciprocal relation between the family and the household and the community. The family populates the community and within a private setting looks to virtue to form the character that guides behavior in both the private realm of the family and the public realm of the city or larger community. Recall that Socrates went to his fellow citizens as a brother or father. Antigone's actions are spurred by her family position, and Haman first speaks to Creon as his son. At the end of the Crito, the laws and the community of the city remind Socrates that he was born, nurtured, and educated by parents whose marriage and household were supported by the laws of the city. Creon also recognizes the connection between the private and public with regard to character, stating, quote, for he who is in his household a good man will be found a just man too in the city, close quote. Though his belief that the city is the ruler's, con rulers contributes to his demise and brings great harm to the city. Though the reciprocal relationship between public and private is desirable, it is not always accomplished as seen in the following three examples. First, Haman, who believes that there is a great distinction for a son in his father's glory, and for a father the distinction of successful children, makes an unsuccessful attempt to bridge the family and the city by being watchful on his father's behalf of the opinions of the citizens and imparting to Creon the error that he makes by condemning Antigone. His father's rejection of his counsel and that of others sets in motion a disastrous set of events, which harkens back to Creon's belief that the city is the ruler's. Second, Antigone is caught between the private and the public realms when her actions on behalf of her family are contrary to the public proclamation that forbids her deed, the burial of her brother. She knows what she must do and acts in spite of the threat to punishment. Third, Socrates tells the, er the jurors that he went to them in private in his quest to encourage virtue and likens himself as a father or brother to them, but instead of receiving leisure to exhort them, free meals in the Prytaneum, he is sentenced to death. In addition to these examples that show the defensible and good conduct exhibited by Haman, Antigone, and Socrates being rejected or punishment or punished, 
The clearest indication of the insufficiency of what occurs in the public and private realms as guided exclusively by human beings comes from Socrates. His explanation to the jury that the meaning of the Pythia's pronouncement that no one was wiser than Socrates means that human wisdom is worth little or nothing and indicates that something more is needed. The faulty decisions made by Creon and by Socrates' accusers and judges and the ensuing misfortunes that the families endure prompt the following questions. First, are those who act in the public and private realms able to achieve and support the beneficial and reciprocal relation between the family and the community? Second, what is required for the good formation in the household to lay the groundwork for a good citizenry and a just community? Third, how does the citizenry and community in turn support the family? A common element in both works is the acknowledgement of a higher law, which serves to inform the private and public realms and guide the family, citizens, political rulers, and the community. Antigone, Socrates, and others refer to it as a guide to their behavior, thus supplementing the instruction and formation that the family and community provide. Antigone describes, quote, God's ordinances unwritten and secure they are not of today and yesterday, they live forever. None knows what first they were, close quote. Creon admits that he should have kept the old accepted laws. The chorus, when describing man, explains, quote, if he honors the laws of the earth and justice of the gods, he has confirmed by oath high in his city, close quote. Haman refers to, quote, the natural sense that the gods breed in men is surely the best of their possessions, close quote, and explains further, quote, if a much younger man like me may have a judgment, I would say it were far better to be one altogether wise by nature. But as things include not to be so, that it is good also to learn from those who advise well, close quote. The laws in the community of the city tell Socrates at the end of the Crito that because the fatherland is more honorable, venerable, holy, and esteemed, that he must follow it or else, quote, persuade it what is just, what the just is by nature, close quote. Socrates' frequent mentions of the God as guiding his conduct indicate that there is more than a sole reliance on human wisdom. The words may differ. God's ordinances, the laws of the earth, justice of the gods, wise by nature, just by nature. But their common theme is that they are expressing something that is not man-made, but higher than man, eternal and universal. A clue to discerning what we call the higher law is in Socrates' quest to dispel others from thinking that they have wisdom when they do not. If one presumes to know, he will no longer seek the truth and may settle for flawed human wisdom. By contrast, if one begins with assuming that he does not know, then the quest for wisdom continues and flawed human wisdom is less likely to prevail. Socrates engages in this pursuit through dialogue and reasoned discourse to discover wisdom, knowledge, and truth. He tells the jurors that he does not teach, but that anyone can listen when he questions others. His end is to encourage them to engage in the same questioning and dialogue. Just like being virtuous is an active pursuit, so is seeking wisdom and discerning a higher law. The first three examples underscore the importance of searching for knowledge and truth. First, Creon was guilty of presuming to know something when he rejected the counsel of Haman and Tiresias and did not attempt to understand Antigone's actions. He learns his error too late and suffers disastrous consequences. Had he not presumed to know and accepted the counsel offered and engaged in the pursuit of the right answer, an answer that was informed by the higher law, the outcome may well have been different. This example portrays how one can deceive himself with regard to wisdom, a reliance on flawed human wisdom and the consequences of ignoring the higher law. A second example portrays the means to seek truth, whether it be informed by the higher law or not and the consequences of failure. Socrates' accusers are shown to be in error as he questions them, but his efforts to dispel the jurors of the slanders that have undue influence on them and persuade them of the falsity of the accusers' charges fail. Both of these examples lead to injustice. In the first, Creon has dishonored a living soul, Antigone, by sentencing her to death and has kept a dead man, Polynices, on this earth without burial rites and funeral offerings. In the second, the jurors have convicted and sentenced Socrates, a wise man, to death. At first glance, these examples do not seem to be linked, but the former is directly related to the higher law, the knowledge of which would solve the dilemma. The latter is indirectly related to the higher law, with Socrates demonstrating how to open the minds of his judges 
through rational discourse to seek justice. Though Creon is too late in discovering his error, Socrates nearly succeeds, exclaiming, quote, if only 30 votes had fallen differently, I would have been acquitted, close quote. A third example is in sharp contrast to the first two and has a different outcome. Socrates is successful in persuading Crito why it would be wrong for him to flee from prison. He accomplishes this by persuading Crito why it would be wrong for him to flee. He accomplishes, excuse me, he accomplishes this by taking each of Crito's arguments and examining them with him, and then with the laws and the community of the city when his friend can no longer respond. They explore how the actions of a citizen who has been duly convicted can adversely affect the whole community should he reject the verdict and punishment by fleeing. He convinces his friend Crito of the necessity to suffer the punishment. The la this last example ha highlights how the wisdom, virtue, and justice in the city that Socrates has sought throughout his life is actively applied. It also serves to reaffirm this, that Socrates' life devotion to these ideals inform the human being, the citizen, and the community. These ideals are also related to another of Socrates' pronouncements. In the Apology, he rejects silence and exile as punishments, proffering arguments that it is disobeying the God, that his speeches about virtue are, quote, a very great good for a human being, close quote, and that the unexamined life is not worth living. The theme of whether his life will be worth living is also in the Crito when he considers whether he should take his friend's suggestion to flee from prison and live in another city. His speech is about virtue and justice, what is, quote, most worth to human beings and customs of laws, close quote, according to the laws in the community of the city would no longer be possible. Socrates prefers death to the alternatives presented to him given his life's devotion to the very active pursuits of questioning, seeking knowledge, and living virtuously and justly. Considering and subsequently rejecting whether life is worth living under dramatically altered conditions than what he previously experienced in Athens, and stating that the unexamined life is not worth living, brings to the forefront the recognition that the search for wisdom and living virtuously cannot be done in isolation. And while it may begin in the private sphere of the household, it must also take place within the public setting of the community and the city of the city and the community. The activity is not exclusive to only one sphere because citizens and human beings live in both. To have the freedom to engage in the examination that Socrates calls for also requires a government that allows it, a government that is just. Crean as tyrant could not countenance any questioning of his actions, nor could Socrates' accusers withstand examination. The postures held by Creon and the accusers cripple and suppress inquiry within the city and community and undermine any search for truth or quest for knowledge, the very actions that check tyranny, anarchy, and injustice. One may ask if pronouncement of a higher law that supplements and informs human wisdom, as previously discussed, could lead to anarchy. But Socrates' insistence on dialogue and the measures of wisdom, virtue, and justice provide a framework to guide the inquiry. A life worth living for Socrates depends upon continuing the very pursuits to which he has devoted his life. The content of the writings of Sophocles and Plato contain elements that are peculiar to their setting in classical Greece, prayer, sacrifice to the gods as performed by the prophet Tiresias, or the pronouncement of Epithia, that no one was wiser than Socrates. But the overall teaching speaks to human beings and citizens and transcends time and place including the measure of whether a life is worth living. Central features of such a life are questioning as a means to examine one's life, subjecting one's choices to scrutiny with the, live, with the aim of living a virtuous life, exchanges with others through ad, advanced through dialogue, seeking wisdom, and building and fostering a just community that permits the very pursuits that lead to a life worth living. Socrates practiced all of these and encouraged others to do so as well. But the practices speak to all human beings and citizens. The study of these works provoke general questions about the citizen and the answers give further insight into a life worth living. Is the private realm of the family the best setting for beginning the formation of the virtuous character of the citizens? The natural ties that exist among family members, the birth, nurture, and education that have a foundation in the home as articulated by the laws in the Crito, coupled with Socrates expressly stating that he acted in a private capacity to exhort his fellow citizens to a virtuous life, demonstrates how the formation of character can begin in a private setting. 
Antigone, though sad that she was foregoing any future happiness of a family, still honored her obligations that took root in the natural family setting. These arguments and actions raise the question, what are the obligations of a citizen toward the family and the community? The citizens emerge from the foundation that the family provides and becomes a member of the community. Haman attempted to be both son and citizen when speaking to Creon. And Socrates' final words to the jurors give them the charge of exhorting his children to virtuous conduct and reproaching them should they suppose themselves to be something that they are not. The good and just ruler that Haman thought that his father should be and the good and just citizens that Socrates desired that his children should become are examples of the mutual and dual relation between the household and the community. The obligations in the best circumstances turn on virtue, which include in part honoring family and the traditions that sustain it and behaving in a manner that supports justice in the community. Other obligations include behaving toward, behaving toward one's fellow citizens in a manner that is consistent with justice. While it may not have been the intention of Socrates or Antigone to challenge the political order, their actions resulted in just such a challenge. This raises questions about conflict between the public and private elements in a community. What prompts a confrontational posture? Is a citizen obliged to challenge the political order when it is not acting in the best interest of the community, citizen, or family? Did the actions of Socrates and Antigone harm the community or benefit it? Their actions may initially be judged as harming the community because of the chaos that ensues following Antigone's actions to honor her brother and Socrates' trial that left truth and justice wanting. But upon further reflection, they benefited the community. The events led to Creon's realization of his errors, a greater understanding of the limitations of man-made law, and what must be present to make for a good community. The threat to the wisdom, virtue, and justice that Socrates sought to prevent throughout his life was on full display in the trial. Previously, we spoke of a citizen's obligation to uphold standards of justice in a community. A source of conflict is if other citizens in the community or the political leadership are unjust or persecuting those who hold the community or the leadership to a standard that they find untenable. Another source of conflict is within the family. Antigone and Ismene split in their actions regarding what was due to their brother. The model of virtuous conduct can be instilled, instilled and modeled in family relations but the choice of each family member acting in a public setting can differ. All of these questions lead to further consideration of the citizen and the community and Socrates' concern about a life worth living and the conditions that lead to a good life. My introductory remarks made the claim that reading works far removed from present day America is a means to overcome the rupture in America's discourse. My effort this evening has been to use writings by Sophocles and Plato to encourage thinking about the foundation of good communities and the role of citizens within them. Jacques-Louis David's painting, Death of Socrates, that is featured on the Benson Center's Western Civilization webpage, underscores the primacy of texts, like the ones that I have discussed this evening in the larger debate about Western civilization. My hope is that, these, that, that the efforts to engage these readings that laid the foundations of Western civilization contribute to the current debate about civic and civil discourse in America, both in the classroom and beyond. This is especially important in a nation that is deeply divided and risks losing its sense of how communities are best cultivated and cultivated and what it means to be a good citizen. The response to the question in the title of my talk Antigone and Socrates model citizens or rebels is that the rebels, Antigone and Socrates, are indeed model citizens. Thank you. Okay, questions, comments, criticisms? I take it all. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question. So I, I like this. It, it, it's very nice in terms of <clears throat> thinking about the virtues of citizenship. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I, and, and you have, in the Greek cases, the city-states, where mm -hmm. there's a kind of nesting of families within community within a city-state. Uh, it's very unlike the United States, where we have 90,000 governments, and someone can be a, a member of many different governments simultaneously, mm -hmm. and where the call of citizenship might lead in one direction. Let's say, for example, my home state of Texas, 
there are cities that, that have declared themselves sanctuary cities. The state legislature and the governor have declared sanctuary cities something that cannot exist in the state of Texas. Um, so I'm curious about, about the claims of citizenship when there are multiple uh, political orders. And these days, it's not uncommon to hear folks fashion themselves as global citizens mm -hmm. uh, when we don't really have a global right. government other than the UN and, and its cute little blue hats. Um, so I'm wondering what the, <laughs> what the limits of citizenship uh, may be and, and how one thinks about uh, to what community or is it is it whatever I want it to be? Is it just is it the community that I most closely identify with that that I'm going to be the citizen of that community and of that political order that that captures mm -hmm. most closely that community? Mm -hmm. So so I, I I'm not getting the the connection between Greece and the city states and modern polycentric American government with ninety thousand governments. Right. <laughs> Well, that's chapter and, two. And, and, I'll come back next year. And, and, right. <laughs> and, and a global order that some people claim that they are citizens of that. Right, right. No, no, no. Uh, your, your questions and comments are, are right on target. And so, boy, um, I didn't jot down notes, so I may miss something. But, you know, where, where I would start with in, in America, um, I gave a talk um, last uh, summer over on the Constitution. Boy, it's not, it's not easy to talk about the Constitution because, you know, the Declaration is like really is sexy. You know, you can talk about all kinds of things, but the Constitution is tough. And so what I realized is um, I had to start talking about America and talking about political communities. And I made the argument that we have three political communities in America. We had what we had under the British. That was our first political community. We had a revolution. We moved into the second political community that was the Articles of Confederation. We rejected that and we drafted a U.S. Constitution, which is now the third political community that we're living under. So where I would start to answer your question about citizenship and community is with the U.S. Constitution, because that's what governs the states ultimately. They have to recognize and, you know, political figures take oaths to uphold the Constitution. And then they also, you know, the judges have to uphold it, et cetera. And then the states also have to be, you know, consistent with the laws of the U.S. Constitution. So that's the framework that, that I would start with. Now, where do we go from there is, uh, you know, we can start with the Constitution and work downward and look at all of these individual communities. And we can think of the advantages of federalism that allow governance much closer to the people. And that's, I think, a virtue of the American situation or the American, you know, uh, American nation is that we can have, you know, uh, city councils and we can have town halls and we can and then we can also have private associations that allow for governance. So there are many ways to um, participate at many different levels. But at the same time, we cannot forget that the overarching uh, structure is under the U.S. Constitution. So that's sort of a political answer to your question. And that's the legal, question, legal response to your question. I'm from New Mexico, and there are uh, counties that are declaring um, Second Amendment sanctuaries. And I've got also communities that are declaring uh, sanctuary cities uh, for the unborn because uh, New Mexico has some of the... Um, uh, what can I say, some abortion laws that uh, are some of the, I'll say, the most extreme in the nation. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, you know, on the one hand, I, I mean, it's, it's an expression by the people who are terribly frustrated with governance. And so they're trying to find ways that they can um, react to what they're seeing. They're not, they're not, you know, the legislature, the legislators that they're, uh, voting into office are not responsive to their needs. And so they're trying to find ways to maybe circumvent. And then the question ultimately becomes, like your governor in Texas says, are these legal or are they not? And he has to look for not only, look to not only the Constitution of the state, but as well the U.S. Constitution to determine their legality. So, you know, that's one way to respond to your question. The other thing, the other way to respond to your question is, um, you know, looking at that great work by Tocqueville, Democracy in America, who really uh, applauds um, the private um, efforts by citizens to participate in their governance and, you know, private associations, whether they be political or not, political parties or not, or just private associations that allow for, you know, maybe rectifying something in the community or improving something in the community or making a community better. 
So that would be another way that would be out, you know, one step away from the political. As far as the, um, you know, the connection between, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the Greek city-state, the polis, you know, which was a city, and the city, of course, was informed by, you know, the gods that they believed in and, you know, a, a very distinct geographical area. Um, in some ways, uh, you know, we can see that in the United States because we have local city governance. And so that's just a, another means by which people can participate. The other way that we can uh, think about this question is what I was talking about is, you know, this whole concept of higher law, something that is, uh, you know, how do we define justice? You know, is the UN going to define justice in a, in a particular way? And if it's contra in contravention to what the U.S. Constitution defines it, well, then, uh, you know, w w there's tension there. And how is it going to be resolved? Um, I would come back and say that uh, this is where we can really benefit from these readings with the whole concept of dialogue. You know, the great question, what is justice? And what does it mean to have a just community? What if we have the UN stating something? And what if we have our, you know, the state of Texas or, you know, the nine justices of the Supreme Court stating something? That's what I'm trying to recapture with some of these um, you know, going back to some of the, and well, that's what I'm trying to recapture going by looking at some of these um, readings, uh, particularly from Socrates, all of the platonic dialogues, I think is truly relevant to what we're um, experiencing today in terms of really going back to the root, the fundamental question, the what is question. So I've given you a lot of different answers. I don't know if I've satisfied you in any way or well, I'm not sure what the citizen and how the citizen chooses when there's a conflict mm -hmm. between, between governments that claim legitimacy and are legitimate in the sense that they were mm -hmm. they were elected in a in a public process. So, oh yeah, that lives in a sanctuary I've, city. <laughs> I've lived in California for 23 years, and believe you me, we have uh, we have plenty of of um, well, there are plenty of instances in court cases where California has chosen a path that's directly in contravention with the U.S. Constitution. So be drinking and, the hemlock. Right. Not. <laughs> right. Right. That's the question. That's what Socrates had to answer. Right. I don't know if, which hemlock or not to, to sip. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, I think uh, prior to that, remember he was uh, he made it to seventy years old, and he uh, did not shy from going uh, uh, out in to the public to address you know these questions and to encourage his fellow citizens to um, do the same, to engage in the dialogue and to seek through the capacity of human reason. Because you can say, well, we've got all these different creeds. I mean, we could, you know, we could have an exercise here and many of you could come up with different, um, you know, examples or situations or definitions, but that's where the dialogue comes in. Remember, dialogue through reason. That's what it means. So, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll go on. <laughs> we'll keep talking about it. Please. I really enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was a little bit of whimsical uh, mm -hmm. question here. That's okay. <laughs> it shows my naiveness on this. Um, civil discourse versus civil war. I think of Lincoln. I'm mm -hmm. trying to place Socrates and Lincoln on a playing field. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can address this whimsical question. Uh, Socrates, rather than Lincoln, was in the period of the 1850s. Would we have had a civil war and would slavery still be present? Oh boy, uh, let's see. <laughs> would we have had a civil war and would slavery still be present? Uh, well, uh, to enslave others is an unjust act. And I think uh, Socrates would begin with the question, um, if we are, he would begin with a question regarding um, what is a just community? And can we in fact abide by and live within a just community when there's a segment of the population that's enslaved? So I think that Socrates would come down on the side that um, it is not a just community that perpetuates slavery, that enslaves human beings and treats them as less than human beings. So I think that's where I would start. Uh, whether or not there would be a civil war, I think would uh, depend upon uh, how effective Socrates was in convincing his fellow citizens of the unjustness of the act. And I think uh, Lincoln's speeches are, are very close to what Socrates, I think, does by, 
you know, asking these questions and getting his fellow citizens to, um, you know, take very seriously these questions to see their actions for what they are. And I want to say one more thing about slavery, because somebody will come back and say, well, wait a minute. Slavery was present in the ancient world. I mean, slavery is still present today. I mean, we can look at, we can name countries where it's still present today. Uh, and I'm going to say that, and, and some will attack Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, Socrates was uh, Plato's teacher, and, Pla uh, and Plato was Aristotle's teacher. So that's the lineage. Uh, Aristotle in his ethics um, talks, in the ethics a little bit, but primarily in his politics, talks quite a lot about um, slavery. And there are those who argue that, you know, slaves were taken in war and, uh, you know, usually to a certain extent incorporated into the community. It kind of, it was not a racial um, foundation. It was more due to war. Um, uh, Aristotle talks about the natural slave. And this is where it becomes very controversial. Are there, the, are there those individuals who, in fact, should be enslaved because they're simply unable to um, care for themselves, defend themselves, you know, whatever. <coughs> kind of, they, they can't, you know, possibly function. And <laughs> this could get me into some real trouble, but I actually, um, I've, I've read Aristotle a lot and thought a lot about this question because I really love Aristotle. And I'm wondering, I'm, I'll, I'm willing to go this far, is Aristotle writing the ethics to teach people to overcome this concept of the natural slave so that they can learn how to govern their passions. And the way I'm taking this back, the reason why I'm talking about this to take this back to the Civil War is that what is at the root of slavery? What is at the root of enslaving other human beings? But the master cannot rule himself. The master cannot uh, prevent himself from enslaving another human. He basically is tyrannical. And what's the definition of a tyrant? But somebody who can't govern himself. So I think th those were the, those would be the kind of things that Socrates would, would bring up. Thank you. Well, go ahead, and then go ahead. A uh, part of the tempest uh, in this country right now is uh, the difference between the originalist mm -hmm. view of the Constitution mm -hmm. and the living Constitution. Mm -hmm. And the civil discourse on this can be pretty tough. Yeah. Could you speak to that, please? Right, right. Well, I think Socrates could speak to us quite to speak to this quite well, and that's uh, the question is is you know what's the standard by which we judge, and that's where the dialogue comes in. You know, um, we have the U.S. Constitution. We have a text that we can read. And there are phrases that can be interpreted in different ways. Are we going to go to, you know, legislative intent? What were the legislators thinking? Well, gosh, golly gee, there they were in the 1700s, you know, in a horse-drawn carriage. Is that, is that, you know, is that relevant to us today? And I always tell my students, well, does it matter whether it's a Porsche or a horse-drawn carriage? It's still a conveyance. They're still moving from part A to part B. And we can have this concept of, um, well, uh, you know, search and seizure. You know, think about, you know, how the Bill of Rights are identified. We, we pull out these phrases and we can understand the concept of, you know, a violation of one's rights if we begin to, once again, go back to the root. Well, and whether you want to call it, you know, an originalist or a textualist interpretation, I think it's consistent with what Socrates would say. It's like, well, why don't we begin with the words on the page and, um, you know, <coughs> seek if possible, some sort of common understanding. If we can't c recommend, you know, find a common understanding, well, then let me persuade you by argument. And I want to hear your argument that is similar. But uh, no, uh, um, I, I, this is again why I, uh, I go back to some of these examples. Step outside of America to see, to have the examples to see how they were either rectified and, and yeah. Socrates died. Socrates was sentenced to death, and he drank the hemlock, and he thought that he should. So, you know, to highlight what Athens um, had done and how Athens had fell. Yeah, so I don't know, does that begin to answer your question? Go ahead. So I have some doubts about the way you cast Socrates and some doubts about the way you cast uh, Antigone. Mm -hmm. So to begin, you play on this contrast between the idea of written and unwritten laws, what's man-made, what's eternal. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to me to be, in practice, a useless distinction. So 
the following reason, no one has direct access to unwritten laws. All you have are man-made interpretations of so-called unwritten laws. Mm -hmm. So in practice, you have the same thing. You have two people arguing about how to read a written law, and two people arguing about how to read an unwritten law, whether mm -hmm. reading an unwritten law makes any sense. So all you have ultimately are interpretations, whether you claim your source is divine or you claim your source is human legislation. Mm -hmm. So the idea that Antigone has any sort of actual edge over anyone else by saying, oh, well, I'm claiming unwritten laws, it's like, well, what do they say exactly? Mm -hmm. Which paragraph, which article? And the reality is that particularly, this is the added irony, is in a society where there is no established hierarchy of the church, there's no dogma, no college of cardinals, nothing that resembles in any remote way an organized religion, but a series of told stories, you have an incredibly chaotic situation. So the idea that if you could pull anyone of what the unwritten laws are and come up with any sort of coherent view is incredibly unlikely. So you can go around invoking unwritten laws. You'll get no further than invoking written laws. So the idea that this actually helps anyone um, is it's not a, in any way a useful thing to practical guidance. Now, you also keep on coming up with this other contrast I find somewhat strange, which is the idea of being a good citizen in community. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, in the Crito, uh, in the Crito, in another text of Plato, we just don't get polis, we get patris. Patris mm -hmm. in Greek does not refer to the political institution, but to the fatherland, which is about not laws, but something like ethnicity, or a nasi, or a nation. Right. Now, you do not break the laws of the only state you belong to to be a good citizen, you do that to be a good Greek, or something like that. So let's give mm -hmm. a contrast. So, McIntyre, in his essay, uh, his Pages of Virtue, talks with Adam von Trott. Adam von Trott plots to kill Hitler, like a bunch of other German resistors. He doesn't do this to be a good Nazi citizen. There's only one kind of citizenship in 1944, that's Nazi citizenship. He does it to be a good German. Mm -hmm. So here, the question is not being a good citizen, and if the citizenship is defined by laws, then the only laws you belong to are the unjust laws. So the question is not about being a good citizen, but being a good member of the community, which is usually older and will, in many cases, survive the laws. Mm -hmm. So it's easy probably to confuse it. In America, you have one regime. But if you take a country like France, you have five republics, two monarchies, restored right. monarchies, two empires, and a commune in about 250 years. It's quite clear that what endures is not the political community, but a pre-political community. So you keep on casting this in terms of being a good citizen. It seems like citizenship is established by laws. It's precisely under the unjust laws you don't like. So it seems to me that that's not the right way to see it. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't see how these two contrasts are doing the work you think they're doing. Right, right. So where to begin? Well, uh, let's revert back to Aristotle for just one minute. Um, you know, he introduces the concept of the good man and the good citizen. And what's the measure of the good man? Well, uh, you know, whether you want to call it an unwritten law or something that can be um, accessed through a human reason, through dialogue, through the use of, you know, conversation to determine what, or a, a conversation, I, I really mean to elevate it somewhat because it's not just idle conversation, it's, con uh, it's conversation that leads to some sort of understanding. It may still result in disagreement, but nonetheless it still uh, is um, advanced by what human beings are capable of. And they're capable of exercising human reason. Not everybody does. Now. Uh, you know, that begins to, to address, I think, your question about, um, you know, the fatherland and, yes, the Greek. Yes, and I admitted that there were many things within the Socrates, um, the Socratic dialogues, and as well within um, Antigone that um, were true for those times and places. But what I'm trying to pull out from them is um, that which is universal. That, and I believe that there is such a thing as a universal concept. Maybe that's where we disagree, that you, don't, that you reject the concept of something being universal. I'm not quite sure. But, uh, you, know, the, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, what else do we have? Are we just going to have, you know, we certainly don't want um, whoever's stronger to prevail. Um, I don't think we want to go that direction. I think because we have the capacity of human reason, it can be exercised and used. And whether uh, you know you want to call it, an, you know, I'm using um, Antigone's words, a concept of an unwritten law. Uh, whether you want to use it in terms of a higher law, you know, something that is beyond, um, not something that's written, but something that can be discerned through um, human reason. I mean. Uh, yeah, the other alternative is simply to fall back on 
you know, what human beings write, but even that has to be subjected to scrutiny. Even that has to be subjected to discerning whether or not, you know, it's good, whether or not it's something that can be defended, whether or not arguments can be made for it. And it's quite possible that at the end of the day, it could be wrong. I, and so then it has to be re-examined. That's why I drew out of um, Socrates in the Apology, his example of um, human wisdom, you know, to a certain extent is inadequate. And so that's why the pursuit of wisdom must continue, why the pursuit, why the questions must continually um, be asked. So I don't know if that begins, I don't know that I can satisfy you. You um, gave a number of things and I didn't take notes, but um, that's the beginning of where I'd go um, to respond to you. Well, look, this is not about universal. You gave us at least two sets of contrasts. So let's just let's just focus on the second set of contrasts. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're contrasting between being a good citizen and being a good human being. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is, you can argue as long as you want about being a good human being. Okay. Now you can try to end that conversation by appealing to some unwritten law. It's basically the move that Antigone does. Antigone says, "Look, I have this fail stop." I get to say there are these unwritten laws. The problem is that once you invoke unwritten laws, you're, then you're not ending the conversation, you're beginning a new conversation. Mm -hmm. So you, you haven't solved the issue. If you say level one human legislation gets judged by level two divine or unwritten law, and we're still left arguing about divine or unwritten law, then you're forced with either one of two options. Either you're in an infinite regress of standards or a conversation which doesn't end, which means you don't get a practical judgment. Or you think you can end it. Now, if you think you can end it, you have to explain to me how exactly we get to a clear answer on what the unwritten laws could be. Mm -hmm. I that's think... not an obvious question at all. And this is particularly strange, again, given the context that if you don't have an established authority that can tell you what the unwritten laws are supposed to be, assuming that could actually work, then you're stuck with this endless dialogue. So you're back with infinite regrets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, as human beings, we have to make decisions. We have to act at some point, and we have to, um, whether it's we're at the point where we have to write the law, like for example, we chose as a people to draft the US Constitution when we deemed the um, Articles of Confederation as inadequate, it was drafted. Do we understand absolutely everything in it? There are plenty of passages that we're still trying to understand, but at the end of the day, we have to arrive at something if we're going to be a of functioning people. Are we, and I'll argue that what capacity that we can use is um, uh, human reason. I'll go back to that. You know, if you want to take the case of Antigone, she, she defended her action by reverting to what she understood was the higher law. Creon comes back to that at the end of his dialogue, at the end of the play, and says, yes, I offended the higher laws by not honoring the dead. You know, how do you determine? You bury the brother who, uh, you know, attacked the city and you leave, um, or you, you bury the, the brother that defended the city. Creon made a decision. Antigone disagrees with it initially because of the, um, the fact that it was her family. She was, had the obligation to bury her brother, but at the same time, I think there's another layer that Sophocles is trying to get us to understand, and that's the fact that there's a higher law that will defend her. She may not have the, the, you know, the capacity of reason for Socrates to articulate it in that manner, but I gave the example that Socrates is, what Socrates says is to care for oneself and to care for the city more so than you know, the, the goods, the money, the wealth, and so on and so forth is what is required as a fundamental component of the good citizen. Now, she invokes the whole concept of an unwritten law. Some will call it the divine. And, you know, you know we can revert to a, you know, a religious interpretation. If you want to take Zeus, her religion, or you can, uh, you know, look at, um, you know, principles of Christianity in terms of what to do. But, you know, the, when, I, when, I, when she looks to something else, because the written proclamation of Creon, that which was the written law, Creon ultimately couldn't defend, I don't think. He was wrong. And so, you know, he had to, um, he, he lost. <laughs> he lost quite a lot because of his, um, 
his decisions and his proclamation and not listening to other people who are wiser, not looking into the community and such. So, uh, you know, uh, what we come back down to, the reason why I, I choose these two particular characters was because I think they inform one another and can, you know, take a step by step in seeing how the two can interact. Two, I mean, Socrates and Antigone, I said, are about as different as you can possibly get. But at the end of the day, for finding a resolution, and we have to have a resolution. You know, uh, something has to be done. And so how do we get to um, the decision of that being done? Well, we go back and we, you know, we ask the what is questions or we ask, you know, is this the right decision? And ultimately it wasn't. I make the argument that it can be informed by something that is, you know, maybe not written, something that is unwritten, something that can be um, discerned through human wisdom. The arguments can come, the interpretations can come, and yes, it can be very dangerous, but at the end of the day, you know, I fall back on the argument that because, you know, the way that we can achieve something that's universal is through the discussion and through um, the capacity of human wisdom. But I take very seriously what Socrates says about the, uh, what? Uh, in a f human wisdom it, it can be ineffective. And so there you've got the pursuit, the philosophia, the pursuit of wisdom. I, I don't know, I don't know that I'm maybe able to convince you or if I'm, if I'm, if it's satisfactory, but I'll keep thinking about it. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure. Please. Yeah, I'm just like, I'm sort of quick uh, question, I think. I mean, it's the way, I, I like to talk, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, and, I, and I think I agree with a lot of it, but I, I'm kind of sort of, the way I'm hearing what you're saying is this, you're sort of casting conflict with kind of the engine of virtue religion or conflict with dissonance in a way. And so I was wondering, as you're talking and responding to some of these questions here, how, how far are you want, will, are willing to take that? Um, so with regard to potentially the implementation or the implication of rhetoric, right, whether rhetoric uh, in, in, uh, in conflictual relations might play a kind of a distorting role in, in revising uh, the virtues or in sort of working things out. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, I'm sorry, the, the conflict is? Well, I understand, the way I understand sort of a lot of what you've been saying is that the conflict's doing a lot of work here, right? And it's not, mm -hmm. it's not this, this uh, engine of destruction so much, but rather as an engine of kind of like virtue revision. Right, or an attempt. It's a, it's a, it's a mechanism by which we revise mm -hmm. the virtues, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that, that's true of Creon. Uh, that's true to an extent with, with Socrates. Um, uh, you know, though he's sort of abiding by the laws of Athens and whatnot. So um, I see conflict doing a lot of work for you, right? Mm -hmm. but, but I can't believe that all conflict is is, uh, is virtuous or good, right? Or that all, all, all. <laughs> I'm sure. Would, you know, engage uh, the state. Um, so, so are you talking about the characters of, of Socrates and Antigone uh, uh, being the the the, con the source of the conflict, or or the situations that they're in the that's that they're somehow um, addressing the conflict in a particular way? I think that uh, I think I'm not talking about the characters, uh, but rather just about the, the nature of the virtue. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's how I hear what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. right? Which is to say. Um, one thing that they're doing, right, both Socrates and Antigone, is challenging existing law. Most right? definitely, yeah. And and, uh, and they're doing that in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, constructive right? mm -hmm. for the building up of virtues or for the revision of the virtues. Mm -hmm. um, so conflict is doing that work for them mm -hmm. um, and because they're engaging, right? Right. That That's conflictual, agonistic, maybe. Right. Right. Um, so, how far does that go, though? Right. I mean, there are a lot of people who will engage in conflict just for the sake of conflict, or who will oh, yeah. for the purposes <laughs> of trying to distort uh -huh. right, uh -huh. or something along those mm -hmm. lines. And that's, that's kind of what I, I have in mind. Right. I don't know if you consider that, because you're saying these are model citizens, yada, 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 about oh, right. two of them. Um, but who, how do we determine who is a model citizen and who is not a model citizen? Right. Another way of putting that question. Right, right. When, when they're engaging or challenging the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's why um, we can't we can't isolate the citizen without putting the citizen within the context of the community, and we have to uh, yeah examine their actions. Uh, I talked about you know I said my goodness with all of these these terrible results 
at the end of uh, you know at the at the end of Antigone at the end of Socrates, what can we possibly learn from them? Because at the end of the day, you know, I'm I'm very practical when it comes to politics. Even though I love to teach political philosophy, at the end of the day, I know that we have to get up the next day and we've got to you know go to work and teach our children and you know whatever. And so there always has to be some sort of a practical remedy. Is the conflict going to be there? Well, yes, of course. Uh, and how much the, uh, you know, how, how we attempt to address the conflict, again, I'll come back to, you know, very much the dialogue. We can't stop talking about it. And at some point we have to make a decision. But at the same time, there's always going to be conflict. And, and, you know, can we allow that conflict to simply destroy us? And there are plenty of communities that we can point to where the conflict has resulted in the destruction. And I don't think your question is, is whimsical or, you know, at all. On the contrary, I mean, think of the loss of human life and the loss of the economy and really how the, the nation was fundamentally reshaped after the Civil War. I mean, that was the ultimate in the conflict. So the question becomes is, you know, can we avoid such conflict in, in, you know, such dramatic consequences? And what do we do to prevent it from getting to that point? But maybe I take on conflict is because it's always present and because of its really destructive forces. But is there a means by which we can, you know, either circumvent it or try to understand it or maybe, you know, use it to you know, use that force because it is a tremendous force to maybe reshape, readopt, re, uh, you know, attack the the situation in a different way. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm going to dare something. Mm -hmm. which, uh, Professor Hill will have to give me the viewing. I want to extend his question, but in a rather different formulation. Mm -hmm. uh, what I hear him asking is something like. The exchange of ideas or interpretation is something transactional. Mm -hmm. And that's what sets the human conflict. So let's call it a discursive transaction. And the question is, is there any reason to have confidence that the net of discursive transactions is positive or encouraging? It eventuates in virtue or the affirmation of virtue. Something like that is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very, I need you to distinguish your Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can just keep you around. <laughs> so the question is, 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 you say the net of discursive actions. There is any confident that the net outcome of discursive transactions is positive. And discursive, you mean? It's using a reason, logos. Uh-huh. Posing alternate conceptions, views, ideas. Challenges, however, we want to yeah. I think both questions are really asking that in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And is, and so, so just repeat the question again. Is it positive? Yeah, do we have any reason to be confident that the net outcome is positive? Oh, we have no reason to be confident whatsoever. Of course not. <laughs> and that's, oh. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely not. Hey, everything is on the table. But we can't walk away from it because I don't want to lose. You don't want to lose. Why do you get up every day? And I know what you do. I know how you contribute to the community. But no, there, is, there are no guarantees. Look at the Civil War. In spite of there being a Lincoln, look at the Civil War. No, the stakes are huge. And this is one of the reasons why, uh, A, uh, you know, I go back to those works that speak to me and B, why I, you know, dedicate my teaching to inviting students to trying to encourage them and also members of the public to read these things, to think about it in a dramatically different way. Certainly one way that I don't think we should lose. And that's why, I mean, I, it was, you know, I was reading about the Benson Center and I, I commented on this painting, The Death of Socrates, that's on the Benson Center's Western Civilization webpage. If I had had my act together, I would have had it up there on the screen, but you know, I'm not, I, I, I thought about that later. But no, go back and look at it. It's the death of Socrates about to drink the hemlock. 
So no, there are no guarantees whatsoever. And that's probably why, you know, even, even if you think my attempt has, has failed dramatically, that I've not convinced you in the least, that's not going to stop me from reading these dialogues and trying to present them in the way, uh, in a way that, you know, encourages people to think and also realize the stakes. They're very high. I mean, we are not joking, you know, when it comes to collapses of civilization. Yeah. He drank the hemlock. Socrates. Uh, um, sure, you know, and I. Oh, oh. <laughs> we can take, we can take the spotlight off of, you know, uh, invite people to join us in a reception. Thank our speaker and also join us in a reception outside. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for listening and for your questions. I appreciate them.